Before we continue on to our next story, one more point of interest. An oddity in the cemetery. Before us are two headstones made of tin. These are remnants from the Great Depression. When these folks could not afford stone, the 18th of July, 1917, Greenville Independent. George Batson, son George, nephew Ellen of Ionia, and Austin Rasmussen, son of Oscar Rasmussen of this city, were so badly injured in a collision at Hoyt's Corners in Orleans while riding in an automobile that they all died soon after. George Batson, former proprietor of a hotel and restaurant at Ionia, was driving a new Buick 6 last Wednesday, came to Greenville for a little visit and called upon Mr. and Mrs. Oscar Rasmussen. As Mr. Rasmussen was going to Detroit that afternoon for Ford cars. You see, Mr. Rasmussen was Greenville's Ford dealer at the time. The Rasmussens invited the invitation to go to Ionia and visited until her husband returned. The nine people in the big six were approaching Hoyt's Corners along a beautiful piece of road. The crossing where the accident occurred is clear, and it is improbable Mr. Batson did not see the approaching train. That he was at the time driving very fast is generally believed because of the deep ruts made by his auto in skidding some distance after he applied the brakes. Not being able to stop his auto, he turned one side into the ditch, and as he did so, the train engine struck the auto and threw it some 30 feet from the tracks. The accident occurred shortly after 5 p.m. by the train due to Greenville at 5.40. Now, as the local Ford dealer, the Rasmussens had previously vowed never to be caught dead in a Buick. The 12th of December, 1900, Greenville Independent. The morning, this morning, the body of Lou Campbell, who has been missing since late August, was found under a heap of rubbish and dirt in the northeast part of the farm known as the Dodge Farm situated just 40 rods north of the city limits. This morning, Messrs. Bannister, J.R. Brown, and Walter Briggs commenced digging in the barn where the suspected murderer occupied. While Briggs was clearing away the rubbish, he stuck his fork into the ground. On pulling up the fork, he discovered a piece of cloth sticking to the tines. This caused him to renew his labors with assiduity and removing the earth about a foot. He discovered the head of what appeared to be a man eaten by lime. The body was carefully put on a blanket and taken out of doors where an examination was made. The body was clothed in a pair of overalls, vest, shirt, and felt boots. The head was loose from the body all the flesh and the muscle eaten away by the lime in which the body had been packed. In looking for a cause of death, the outer skull was found to be broken. This in connection with a heavy club found covered in blood and a room in Campbell's house sprinkled with blood stains on the floor, walls, and ceiling. Furnished a reasonable hypothesis as to how Campbell came by his death. As to the murderer, there has been no doubt in the minds of all, owing to the fact that Samuel Applin was wearing the deceased's clothing and had all his property and had taken his mail from the post office. But Nothing could be done until it was known that Campbell was dead. One of the principal rumors flying around is that old man Applin says that his son was the man 
who killed Campbell with a club. This confession must be taken with a grain of caution, for old man Applin is such a liar, thief, and all-around crook, but little credence can be placed upon what he says. The old man does not bear any love for his son, having several times tried to make trouble for him. Once, in Flint, he put on his son's clothes and set a house on fire and then tried to throw the crime onto his son. It was proven that the son was innocent and the old man was sentenced to state prison. Both Applin's father and son are in Stanton jail. The elder Applin has been bound over for trial in circuit court. Public sentiment is that he is the murderer. The son Applin generally believed to be wrongly accused will have his examination Friday in Greenville. Jokes about murders aren't funny unless they're properly executed. Before I begin, for what it's worth, if you take a good look at the Appleton Mausoleum, you will see evidence of your donations at work. This is one of the many projects taken on by the Friends of Forest Home which makes this another one of my friend's favorite stories. This one's a long one. From the Detroit Post and Tribune. Two weeks ago, we gave in condensed form the particulars of a murder said to have been committed 15 years ago and recently confessed on her deathbed by a woman, the victim being her husband. The account occupied nearly two columns of the Pontiac commercial, and we stated our opinion as to the extreme fishiness of the yarn. The facts set forth are as follows. The murdered man was named Appleton, and he lived near Greenville. Fifteen years ago, Mr. and Mrs. Appleton, with a niece and nephew, resided there. The boy, who was about 16 years old, no longer able to bear the bad usage to which the Appletons had subjected him, ran away. The girl, about 11 years of age, was in the home at the time Mr. Appleton disappeared, and it was thought by some persons that the girl had some vague knowledge of his whereabouts and what had been done to him by her aunt. About one year after the uncle's disappearance, the niece went missing. There are those that hint at foul play with her by her aunt in consequence of her fears that the girl knew of her killing the uncle. Mrs. Appleton was a clever doctoress and compounded salves and drafts for every ill that flesh is heir to. And further, she was a professional abortionist she took in boarders, and many severe things were said about the detestable Mother Appleton. During the past two years, she had retired from her horrible business and became a severe kind of Christian and kept a hired girl who was rather demented. This girl was suddenly removed to the poorhouse, and she would talk in a rambling manner of sorts pertaining to the particulars of Mr. Appleton. About this time, Mrs. Appleton had a handsome brick vault built in the Greenville Cemetery and was in many ways, especially towards the church, very lavish with her means. Dr. Avery, one of the best physicians for many miles, was summoned as Mrs. Appleton's health began to fail rapidly. Her confession, referred to in the Pontiac commercial as made, put in writing, and signed by Mrs. Appleton in the presence of her reverend, her doctor, and her lawyer. These gentlemen were astounded at the horrible revelation, which was, by some of them, regarded as a chimera of the brain of the dying woman. But a search of the well, where she stated that she had thrown the body revealed the skull and bones of a human being. Here was 
proved conclusive. Greenville Independent, 1879. As is verified by the statements of Dr. Avery and Reverend Patton hereafter, the story is an outrageously cruel falsehood, dishonoring the member, memory of a poor Christian woman who lived a quiet, unobtrusive life in our midst. The article quoted refers to the niece and nephew. There was never either niece nor nephew. An adopted daughter lived with Mrs. Appleton until she married Mr. Van Lu of Big Rapids. The hired girl, rather demented, is Noli Appleton, an adopted motherless girl who grew up crippled, but not demented. No bones were ever found in her well. None were ever searched for. In fact, she didn't have a well on her property. A few months before her death, she mortgaged her home for $500. She used $100 to purchase a lot and build a stone vault for her remains. The balance was used to make her last days as comfortable as possible and to defray the cost of funeral expenses. The Reverend Patton wrote the Greenville Independent on September 1st, 1879. In it he said, to the best of my knowledge, the story is an unmitigated fabrication. As to the rehash of this gossip in a late number of the Pontiac Commercial and other papers, the writer of it seems to have sought only to perpetuate a coarse, low joke upon you gentlemen of the press. He certainly did not expect anyone in Greenville to believe it. You know, someone once told me, I hope you die in a deep hole filled with water. I think they meant well. I'd rattle off some more jokes about wells, but to be honest, I'm running dry.